This video will highlight many of the new features of the inline and in-check 7.2 release. The most prominent change to inline for the 7.2 release is the introduction of workspaces. Workspaces allow the user to save the configuration of an inline instance and restore the application back to that configuration when desired. Workspaces actually allow you to configure and restore most of what you see within the application. Um, to the extent that where, to where you can apply a workspace and essentially uh, create a sub program within the application. For example, suppose we wanted to have a workspace that was focused on performing analysis of an individual aircraft. We can use the workspace selector at the top right of the program and change from the default workspace to our aircraft, aircraft dashboard workspace. The aircraft dashboard workspace is designed to display all of the information for a single aircraft. At the top of the left, uh, at the top left portion of the window, we can choose which aircraft we want to display information on. We can apply the change, and then all of the windows of the application will update to display information for just this aircraft. As you have already seen, uh, not only did it change what windows are visible, but it also changed um, what their placement is, how they're docked, um, what data they're displaying, what charts are available. And with this particular workspace, we can look at the maintenance history of the aircraft that we have selected. So we instantly see um, you know, all of the TCTOs that have been performed, um, so on and so forth. We can look and see um, what the current status is of this aircraft. So we can uh, we know what the actual flight hours are, equivalent flight hours, what its home base is. We also get the three-dimensional view of all the information um, that has been recorded for this individual aircraft, all of the NDI findings, uh, the crack history, a chart showing the crack history, flight hour history for the aircraft, so on and so forth. So by applying a single workspace, we're able to configure the application to be focused on uh, individual aircraft analysis. So what else can we do with workspaces? Suppose we wanted to have a workspace that was more oriented towards management type charts. So we're looking at performance reports and analysis and things of, of that nature. So I apply the performance report uh, workspace and inline will actually completely change itself to, and I'm going to just apply the, uh, the data load here to display a series of charts. So with, by applying this workspace, we've actually just changed all of the data that's displayed from a more engineering analysis type um, application to really a more uh, management chart or any type of application. What if we wanted to focus in on just a specific inspection? We can have a workspace that's associated with a fictional inspection area of this fictional aircraft named Inspection 002. So when I apply this workspace, it takes me to the inspection area and I'm going to have it pull the data for it. Now we're looking at all of the data that's been recorded for this inspection, what tail numbers have been 
um, this inspection has been performed on and what their data looks like, what types of information have been performed, so on and so forth. Workspaces can also be used for data entry and inline and in-check configuration. Suppose you wanted to have a easier way of getting to all of the information that's related to setting up in-check. Um, you can create a workspace and I have it called in-check setup here and it will configure the application. Let me uh, refresh the data to show all of the inspections and the inspection templates as well as a three-dimensional view and the layers tree uh, so that you can quickly access all of the uh, trainable information that's associated with um, setting up in check. Now, of course, you can see that applying the workspace has also applied the data set so that we can access um, just the information that we're interested in. And you can edit that data set as well if you wanted to fine tune on the information that is uh, associated with this uh, in check setup. So what does a workspace consist of? If we look at a workspace, um, you know, the first thing to do is to place the application in the configuration that you would like. So with 7.2, uh, we now have fully dockable what we call smart windows where every window within the application can be docked anywhere else. Um, you can also float these windows by clicking on a particular window and floating it and if you want to you can lock it as well so that it doesn't um, doesn't try to dock back into the application. So once you have the application in a state that you would like to keep, um, then you would access the um, workspace window. So we choose File, New Workspace, and we're presented with the workspace uh, details dialog. At this point, I can give it a name and choose what entities I want the workspace to save. So asset selection is actually a, a very nice option to have. What it means is when this workspace is applied, not only will it change the window settings, but it will actually choose the proper assets that are appropriate for uh, that workspace. So if you had a workspace that was oriented towards inspection data entry, um, you can choose that workspace and it will select just those assets um, that are necessary for inspection data entry without selecting all the other assets that you don't want um, for data entry if you have other, uh, you know, ASIP oriented assets or specialized assets that people doing data entry wouldn't want to have selected. Um, we've actually taken this a step further in that when you start the application for the first time, um, you're actually presented with a workspace selector instead of an asset selector. And if you have you know, an environment set up to where you need to select multiple assets in order to um, you know, get work done, where one asset may have your models and another asset may have one set of data and another asset has another set of data, your users no longer have to remember which sets of assets to select. They can just select the workspace that's specific to their task. So if they're in a structural engineer, they can select the workspace for structural engineering. If they are an ASAP engineer and they're doing that type of work, they can select the workspace for that. If they're um, doing inspection analysis or inspection data entry, so on and so forth, uh, there would be a workspace for that. So window layout, as we've seen, that will move the, all of the different windows of the application to their various um, places and it will be saved and restored regardless of what screen, your screen resolution is. So if you are creating a workspace on a you know, 1920 by 1080 screen, um, someone on a, on a 4K display is still going to be able to apply that workspace and have the windows laid out in the same logical manner that you um, established on your 
um, lower resolution screen. And of course it goes the other way as well. View window settings. So that is the 3D view. So all of your camera settings, as far as what you're looking at, um, what models are visible, um, what the render formats are of those models, that can get stored along with the workspace as well. Trainable table settings. So that includes you know, what columns are visible, um, what data set and such is, is available there. Um, chart settings, so that will be you know, just what data sets and what charts are selected, things like that. 3D cluster settings, model name region properties, and of course, user input values as we've seen with the aircraft dashboard. Now, lastly, you can choose whether the workspace is public or private. If you choose private, then the workspace is only visible to you. If you choose public, then everyone can access that workspace and it can be shared amongst your group so that uh, they don't have to create it themselves. Several enhancements were also added to the dataset system. So, these can be accessed in the uh, dataset editor. The first change is that uh, by default, we now display the fields for the selected assets instead of all of the fields within the system. This allows the user to hone in on uh, just the fields that are appropriate to what they're currently doing without wading through um, a large number of fields by default. We've added support for having named regions as user inputs. So now once you add a named region, you can choose to make it a region, a user input. Let's create a new um, one here. You can also do the same for dynamic regions. Trainable types can also be made user inputs now. And we've also made it so that your list fields um, can be uh, multi-select instead of just a single dropdown uh, when they are a user input. So if you wanted to have a list field, for example, uh, that was a, a set of part numbers instead of selecting an individual one, then you can set that up with, okay. By checking the multi-select option here. And now we look at our user input area and we can see there's the edit button for the uh, dynamic region. Uh, there is still the named region selector here. Uh, there's a, a trainable type that we can select. And we have a multi uh, list selection for uh, list fields now. The go-to model feature has always been useful to orient the camera onto a single individual model. In Inline 7.2, you're now able to utilize the same feature in order to go to an entire assembly. The feature is activated in the same fashion by right-clicking on an assembly and choosing Go To That Assembly. It can also be utilized on sub-assemblies. One of the new in-check features for the 7.2 release is the ability to have custom job search buttons. In earlier versions of in-check, you were restricted to having just a not completed button and a assign to me button. Whereas now with 7.2, you can actually create your own buttons of 
an unlimited quantity and you can create your own searches by utilizing the data set system to determine what each button should do. For example, I've added a button to display all of the jobs for my IAT inspections type, and it will display simply all of the jobs um, associated with this inspection type. Now, if I wanted to have a button that instead only displayed the jobs that were waiting for a sheet repair person to take a look at, I can have a data set that with that appropriate logic, then have a button that has uh, that only displays the the jobs that sheet needs to look look at. Or what if I wanted to display the jobs that my NDI personnel needed to look at? I can do that um, accordingly. In addition to the data set that performs the search once a job search button is clicked, you can also supply a data set that will calculate columns that are displayed for each um, of the buttons. For the NDI example here, we can see that there are three um, findings that are awaiting NDI within this job. If we click on our sheet um, search, we can see there's one sheet um, finding uh, that is awaiting sheet personnel to look at it within this particular job. This is performed by calculating a number sheet column as an output field of that data set. Within the NDI search, we can see that there are you know, additional jobs here that do not have a value inside the, uh, the number NDI uh, column. The reason for this is this data set is set up to where if there are no, uh, no findings entered for the job yet, that it is still returned by the uh, NDI search. Because with this particular process, it's designed to where NDI will look at each inspection first. Selecting a job in NCHECK 7.2 takes you to the job overview window. Beforehand, this would be a list of tabs across the top where each finding um, was a separate tab. And it was somewhat difficult to keep track of as the number of findings grew. So the job overview window was created in order to be the single window that displays all the information that the user needs to know about for a single job. At the top, we see the job itself, and underneath it, we see all of the records that have been created for that job. In this case, we're looking at five different um, records that were created as part of this job. On the left-hand side of the job overview window, we see a window area that is very similar to um, what was present inside inline 7.1 and beforehand, where at the bottom you get a, an inspection image that is a, a preview of the inspection area. And we're just using a stock photo here. Um, but what is new is the ability to have um, these um, data item filters. So the data item filters are buttons that you can um, associate a data set with, uh, the same as you saw with the, the uh, calculated columns for the jobs, that will control what's displayed, which one of these records are displayed for this job. So if we wanted to see all of the findings that were entered for the job, we can click all the findings button, uh, and it shows the five records that have been entered. If we wanted to see just the records that are awaiting NDI, we can click NDI. If we wanted to see just the records that are awaiting sheet. We can see the uh, one record awaiting sheet, so on and so forth. Uh, the key thing to take away from this is that the user is in control of the logic. 
So they're able to configure these buttons to display uh, whatever records they would like to appear here. The required when and visible when feature allows the user to control what fields are required and what fields are visible according to what information has been entered for a finding. In this example, we have a single finding type called inspection finding, whereas you know the first field and only field that we see um, is the actual finding type field. Now, according to what we choose here, we'll drive what else has to be entered for this um, record, as well as what fields are visible for this record. Since this is a crack type, then we are required to enter a crack length. We're required to enter a finding status just to indicate uh, you know, what the, uh, the workflow status is for this record and we're required to enter a location. And we have visible many other different types of uh, many other fields that are appropriate for cracks. If we were to instead choose a disbond type, then we have a completely different set of visible fields and the uh, a different set of fields that are required. In this case, length is required, width is required, um, there is not a crack length field or a um, whole number field in this particular case. So you can have a single type of record with a set of fields and um, utilizing you know, data sets the same as we've seen before. You can control what's visible, what's required, so on and so forth. The part number field can now be automatically populated from the model. This can be done by first selecting the model that you would like to set the part number from, set, clicking your part number field, and then the part number automatically appears as a selectable option from within this dialog. The list value control feature allows the user to control what options are selectable according to information that they have already populated within this finding. For example, I have a list value control on the whole number field. If I look at the whole number field without any models um, selected and with the part number set to this WGR uh, K00, I will see all of the different whole numbers that are available um, for this particular field. However, if I click on this model here and set it as my part number, I have this configured to only allow uh, holes that are actually present on this model. So if I look at the whole number field now, I only see a set of valid selectable items. The same with this model here. Um, if I set this as my part, then the whole number field is updated to only show uh, the set of valid selectable items for that particular uh, part that was given. This does not have to be limited to just part number fields. I have it configured that way, um, but you can utilize any of the fields of the finding and uh, you use it to show or to uh, determine what values are valid for each list field. InCheck 7.2 also allows the user to set up validation rules to ensure the validity of the information being entered. For example, suppose we specify an initial diameter of a half inch 
and a final diameter of a, a 0.3 inches. I have a validation rule set up to ensure that the final diameter is always greater than or equal to the initial diameter. So if the user tries to save this record, they're presented with a message that allows them to uh, go back and correct for any uh, misinputted information. Jobs can now be created from directly within the InCheck application. This is performed by adding a new job creation type button to the uh, job type toolbar. By clicking the job creation button, it will take you to the dialog to begin populating information for the selected job. InCheck now has its own model layers window. This allows the user to navigate the layers tree similarly to how it is performed in inline. And it also has a new layers tab, which exposes several InCheck specific features, such as the uh, model search feature. Selecting a model and then clicking the select button navigates the user to that model within the tree. The models can be shown by either clicking on them. If the camera is not in view, then there is the go to button, which will take you directly to the model. Uh, and the go to button also operates on assemblies, the same as we did, same as you've seen with inline. InCheck is able to populate the location of a finding by utilizing the location of a shape within a named region. I will first set the part number by clicking on the part and setting the part number field, which will limit my selections for the hold number. So once I choose a valid hold number, InCheck will recognize that the part number and the hold number correspond to a named region shape and it will ask me if I want to update the location field to reflect that shape location. If I choose yes, the location is updated, the whole number field is updated, and the record is placed in the center of the shape. Data matrix barcodes can now be utilized to populate information in both InCheck and Anline. This is done by first clicking the barcode scan button and then using the onboard camera to scan a compatible barcode. Anline or InCheck will then decode any barcodes that it finds and display the information and their field mapping to the record that you're populating. Once you click the Yes button, it will populate the fields with the information obtained from the barcode. Barcode scanning can also be combined with the job creation feature in order to begin creating a job with information obtained from the barcode. This can be useful for recording the installed components of an aircraft for doing inventory tracking. If it's scanned, it will automatically begin creating a job with that data. Barcodes can also be utilized to search for any jobs that match the information in the barcode. This can be useful to scan a barcode that's um, embedded on a part that's being inspected and actually pull up the job directly within InCheck. This feature is also available from the inline application.
you can access it by clicking on the barcode button on the main toolbar, scanning a barcode, which will then conduct the search for any records for that um, that match that barcode. It populates the default data set with the search, so you're able to edit that data set and see exactly what it's looking for and make changes if you would like to as well. InShipe 7.2 now has a new Reports tab. The Reports tab displays the same reports that are available within the inline application um, and are able to utilize the same sets of data that are uh, available within inline reports now. Clicking a report within the reports tab and clicking run report will execute it, perform the search, and retrieve information from the server for the report, as opposed to being limited to just information that was available from the selected job. These are the most prominent features of the inline 7.2 release. Thank you very much.